It is not news that climate change is happening and that the detrimental effects of it on people and places around the world is growing. Words such as emergency, crisis, and catastrophe now routinely modify climate in policy, media, politics, and even casual conversation. And yet, humans still do not seem seized enough of the issue to act. Why is that? With us to explain, in Shrewsbury, United Kingdom, George Marshall, author of Don't Even Think About It, Why Our Brains Are Wired to Ignore Climate Change. He's also founder of Climate Outreach. In London, UK, Tally Sharot, professor of cognitive neuroscience and director of the Effective Brain Lab at University College London and the author of The Influential Mind, What the Brain Reveals About Our Power to Change Others. In Woodside, California, Renee Lertzman, climate psychologist and founder of Project Inside Out. And in New York, New York, Lise Van Susteren, psychiatrist specializing in the psychological effects of climate change. And we are delighted to welcome you four to our program tonight. And we're going to put George on the spot right off the top here by reading an excerpt from his book and then requiring him to stay quiet while the other three of you comment on it. We want to hear what they have to say first, George. Here we go. This is from Don't Even Think About It. I have come to see climate change in an entirely new light, not as a media battle of science versus vested interests or truth versus fiction, but as the ultimate challenge to our ability to make sense of the world around us. More than any other issue, it exposes the deepest workings of our minds and shows our extraordinary and innate talent for seeing only what we want to see and disregarding what we would prefer not to know. Okay, Tally, get us started here. To what extent are our minds incapable of grasping and seeing big existential threats such as climate change? Well, I think the problem is is greater because the real, real trouble is not even in front of us, right? I mean, the real trouble is waiting for us in the future. So in order to really uh, be able to take into account climate change, we need to not only be able to perceive what's around us, but also be able to predict what will happen next, especially when those next steps are going to be quite um, negative, right? So I think um, I absolutely agree with, with that statement. And I, I think it's even even greater than that. Humans are not very good at looking into the future. We have so many biases when it comes to looking to the future, and especially when what we're looking at is not very rosy. Okay, Renee, what would you add to that? I would add and build on that, which is that we know that when we are experiencing difficult, challenging emotion or affect, that it has a direct impact on our cognitive ability to process information and translate that into action. And so what um, what we just heard about our capacity to think into the future, it's truly our ability to engage with climate change relies on our ability to have foresight, empathy, um, you know, imagination, um, all those things that the prefrontal cortex is known for. And the paradox is that when we're confronted with these overwhelming threats, unless we feel that we can actually handle it, we will, in fact, really struggle to access precisely those capabilities. Um, And therefore, I think what we're really needing to be thinking about and reframing the issue is not whether people care about the issues. People, humans care very deeply. Mm -hmm. The question is, what are the conditions that we can create that really enable us to face this and engage with this in a really creative, a compassionate and effective way. An interesting distinction, which we will get to during the course of our conversation. Okay, Lise Van Susteren, let's hear from you on that. Certainly, everything everyone has said, uh, I, I agree with. And certainly, as a psychiatrist, for many decades, I will concur that we are not always rational. But we started off on the wrong foot with climate because it started off as a very abstract issue. So, for example, we don't have deniers of earthquakes uh, because earthquakes appeared and bam, we could see all these consequences. So what is imperative is to look at what the challenges are, of course, and to recognize, in addition, and this is a separate sort of topic, that people respond to different messages. And it wouldn't be true that all of us haven't responded to the facts. 
uh, because many of us have said, oh, my God, as soon as we recognized that we couldn't get above 400 parts per million of carbon dioxide, we threw ourselves into action. But, of course, uh, the many other people cope with the stress of hearing disastrous news in other ways. They might avoid uh, they might double down on resisting. They have all sorts of ways of responding to stress. And that's really key because it helps us to understand that different messages are key to influencing the people and to changing the culture. George, you now get to talk. <laughs> you uh, looked at this through a lot of different lenses, a lot of different research to figure out why we seem to be wired to Maybe ignore is too strong a word. Maybe it's not too strong a word. What's the biggest reasons you can see here? Well, what I was trying to outline in, in the quote you gave is that climate change combines multiple forms of, uh, of bias and, um, and of, of poor reasoning. Um, it's, everything, it's everything that my, my colleagues here have said. It's, it's a problem of being in the future. It's a problem of, uh, it's, it's hard, it's challenging, it involves costs, it in, uh, there's emotional pain we're trying to defend ourselves from. It brings all of these things together and the real problem it's hard is because it's in competition with many other issues which are much better designed to grab our attention. So in the, in the kind of attention war which goes on, we're constantly bombarded with information and things to pay attention to. Climate change always slips to the edge because there's other things there that are more immediate, that are easier for us to deal with. We have more agency. We haven't said that either. Like, it's actually very, people have a strong sense of hopelessness about this issue and a sense that there's very little that they can do. So they tend to disregard it. And I'd say the strongest reason is that actually what we pay attention to are the things which are present in our social environments. Climate change is something which people talk about very little, um, it's something which is uh, which is often which is often kept to one side, um, and it's something around which we were just hearing from uh, from Lee's there that um, it's something around which messages are very important. And actually, climate change is very hard for us to form a story around because we're all in various ways complicit. So anything which is trying to grab our attention, like say the war in Ukraine, where there's a there's a bad guy, there's an invader beating somebody up, immediately get our attention or things about the economy immediately grab our attention, but things like this in which we are complicit in the problem are morally ambiguous. Again, it's not that we ignore it, it's just we keep pushing it to one side and paying attention to other things, given right. the precedent. Well, there are competing biases here, and uh, uh, Tally, let me put one of them to you, the optimism bias. What is that? Right, so the optimism bias is our tendency to overestimate our likelihood of experiencing good events in our life, like professional success, and underestimating the likelihood of experiencing negative events in our life, such as uh, being in an accident, being ill, like getting COVID, getting divorced. Um, and one of the reasons we tend to overestimate the positive and underestimate the negative on average is that the brain is actually um, tends to take in information that is surprising in a positive way takes it to update our beliefs more than information that is surprising in a negative way. Um, and this is especially true when the information is somehow related to our own future. And do you think we that's at play here with climate change? Yeah, so I think when it comes to climate change, let's start with like the, the base, which is we tend to underestimate the negative. Climate change is, is gonna be, it's negative, right? So we underestimate the likelihood of this negative event. We also underestimate the likelihood of climate change and the consequence of climate change because it's something that's hard for us to imagine, right? It's not immediate. We haven't quite experienced climate change. We haven't quite experienced the consequences yet, some, but not really what's coming. And that because of that, we can't imagine it vividly in our mind. Things that we can't imagine vividly in our mind, we assume are less likely. Things that are easy for us to imagine, we can really come up with detailed images and vivid in our mind, then we think they're more likely. Um, and so with climate change, yes, we get the information, right? We, we get the data, we get the figures, but what we tend to do as humans is we tend to be less likely to seek out negative information and less likely to take that negative information to update our beliefs. And when it comes to climate change, at least the way that it's presented uh, is usually in a negative format. Hmm. All right, Renee, I've got some uh, words that you have written in the past. Let me read those and share them with our viewers and listeners and then get you to comment. You wrote, when we trigger anxieties, we almost always inadvertently trigger defenses. 
And when it comes to climate change, these defenses act on everyone from greeny urban liberals to climate science naysayers. Okay, fill in the blanks there. What are some of those defenses? Gosh, uh, well, we already know so much about how our minds protect us from distressing unwanted information, just as George outlined in his book. Um, and so we've got already an abundance of insight about this, um, which can, I think, help us navigate this, this um, challenge we're dealing with, these crises. Namely, mm -hmm. denial is the obvious, but it's so much more than denial. It's minimizing, it's distancing, there's projection, there's like, it's all on them. There's um, binary thinking, really the polarization, the black and white, any kind of attempt to simplify and reduce complexity. Um, there's the, the unconscious uh, mechanism of kind of taking what's uh, potentially guilt-inducing or shame-inducing, like I'm a bad person because I actually love my fossil fuel-powered car or I love my this or that. If we have these kind of distressing internal feelings, even on an unconscious level, we tend to kind of want to get rid of it and put it out on others. And then that sets in motion this whole dynamic that we see that can make dialogue and conversation and imagination really challenging. So I think that the reason why we want to understand defenses is because we want to look at what supports our ability to navigate and work through those defenses. And again, we know a lot about that as well. We know that humans actually need connection and community and support to process difficult information, right? We, we tend to work really well in small groups, five to seven. Um, we also cue off of the, all the social relationships we're in. But I think where we want to put attention is what, again, what are the conditions that allow us as humans to stay with what's hard and stay with what's triggering and, and foster that resilience to work through it so we can get to, and now what do we want to do about it? Well, let me pick up on part of that and go to Lee's with it. And that is where, where I think all of us familiar with climate change denial, but there are other less obvious forms, Lee's, of denial as well. Uh, do we need to consider some of those here? Sure, uh, many of those are unconscious factors. And, you know, some of them, it's sort of a, uh, climate is a Pandora's box of dark thoughts, really. It requires that we acknowledge that we're not the masters of the universe, that we uh, might like to imagine that the world is not necessarily the safe place that we would hope. It requires that we uh, embrace uncertainty, et cetera. And it also triggers, frankly, our personal sense of vulnerability. That is, that we're going to get old, uh, get sick, and die. And climate is like a metaphor for that. So we're avoidant. But let me just say that building on that, that there are two key things, and there are all sorts of other unconscious issues. There's, you know, there's aggression, um, which, uh, as I, I have to say, that not recognizing what is happening to future generations or even our children today and the cumulative toll is an unconscious form of aggression. And I think some of us um, not all of us, but some of us look at this as a, a sort of a, a, a narcissistic rage uh, that they're going to be here and we're not. Uh, and also there's anger, I think, at Mother Earth that she's got a timestamp mm -hmm. on our neck. So I think there are embedded unconscious reasons, but we'll get to how to get around these because there are so many ways that we can um, grab on to these unconscious forces and all these emotions and turn them into constructive action. Mm -hmm. George, let me get you to comment on something that was uh, written by Michael Huckster, the research scholar from the Global Institute for Sustainable Prosperity, who has coined this term soft climate denialism. And here's what Michael writes. He says, soft climate <laughs> denial means that one acknowledges in some parts of one's life that climate change is real, disastrous, and happening now. But in most other parts of one's life, one ignores that anthropogenic global warming is, in fact, a real existential emergency and catastrophic. And I wonder, uh, could you speak to this notion of other softer forms of denial being more widespread and dangerous, potentially, than the actual factual denial of climate change? 
For a long time, it was the case that if you asked people, is climate change uh, serious, you concerned that large majorities would mention it. But then if you asked them to name the things that they were really concerned about, climate change wouldn't figure. That there was this ability when you were asking people to focus on it, that they said, yes, I really see that this is a problem. But it immediately just drifted away. It dissipated in the air when, uh, when you tried to ask people to bring it to light. However, I have to say, this is weakening. I think that the difference between these two forms of knowing and not knowing is getting less with time. Uh, certainly, um, we've already heard that climate change feels distant to people, but actually it's, it's becoming more and more real for people. Far, far fewer people are now saying that climate change is a problem for the future than they were even 10 years ago. Many people are saying no climate change is real and happening now. I think that the denial, or rather the avoidance, is much more about its presence in the social realm. That it seems around us, yes, we're having extreme weather, we're, we're, the, the, the evidence is there for us, and most people accept that's because of climate change. But actually, life just goes on pretty much the same as it always has done. We eat the same things, we travel the same way, we fly just as much as we did. And I think that it's that, I think it's for denial of the evidence of a social realm that we, that we may know something, and we may know it, and when we're asked about it, we may be able to present it, but the actual reality of the wider world around us just doesn't seem to reflect it. Well, okay, let me do a quick follow-up with you here. We are buying more electric vehicles. We are no longer, uh, certainly not in our country, I'm not sure about yours, but certainly not here, uh, we're not building coal-fired <laughs> generating stations anymore. You know, we, we are doing some things, aren't we? Well, we most definitely are, of course, as, as all of the people who are meeting right now in Cairo will tell you. We're not doing it fast enough and we're not doing enough of it. But actually, a lot of those things you're talking about are really not visible in, in, in people's lives. I go back to the point of what is what, what psychologists would call saliency. What's salient in people's lives? What's actually there and real for them? And climate change really doesn't figure in that. It's not something that people talk about much. In fact, actually, there's a there's a kind of a still a collective silence around it, and it's it's something which is not a which is not a realistic which is not a realistic presence for people. Um, it's very hard to believe in something which is not talked about. Right, Tally. I want to get you back to the optimism bias, and that is uh, let's get deep in the weeds here. In terms of evolution, how was it an advantage to our survival as a species to have this optimism bias you talked about earlier? Yeah, so having positive expectations of the future, it gives you motivation, right? If you think, I'm going to succeed, my, I'm going to get the promotion, my company is going to succeed, then it gives you motivation to act, right? So your prediction changes your actions, and your actions changes the outcomes. Um, in terms of physical health, um, it's been shown that optimists uh, tend to be healthier and survive longer. Again, it's, a, it's kind of a case where people who think, I am going to do well, I am going to get healthy, I'm going to get over this illness, they tend to do things like follow the doctor's orders, exercise, eat healthy, and so on. And, and perhaps one of the most important things, it relates to exploration. If you think back to our ancestors deciding to leave Africa and go explore the rest of the world, they had to believe that there's something good for them to find outside, something that's better than what they already had, right? So this kind of optimism causes you to explore um, the unknown. Um, so these are all the positive sides. On the negative side, if we are overly optimistic, we underestimate our risk. And if we underestimate our risk, we're not going to take precautionary action that we should, right? Not go to medical screening when we should, not wear a helmet when we should. So these are kind of the disadvantages. Um, the thinking has been that probably the advantages of being optimistic and even optimistically biased perhaps outweigh the disadvantages. And perhaps because of that, humans have evolved to be optimistic. And there's some probably truth in that. However, what we found lately is that it's not quite simple, that people tend to have optimism bias in general. You can see it in about 80% of the population, different Western world, the non-Western world, uh, females, males, and so on. But once you put someone in a very acute, stressful situation in an environment rife with threats, then actually things change very, very quickly. The way that we process information changes, and we actually tend to take in the negative information very quickly. And then the optimism and the optimism bias starts to become smaller and smaller and sometimes even reverses. So I think what is adaptive is not necessarily that we have an optimism bias, but rather that we're able to 
have the optimism bias, be optimistic, but then change in different environments, in threatening environment where perhaps optimism is not the best solution for us. And if you think about things like the pandemic, right? We were put in a very stressful situation. People had this stress reaction and immediately they started to focus on the bad news. They started to take in the bad news. Sometimes they actually became overly pessimistic. And when the threat was immediate in front of them, um, behavior in general changed. You know, not everyone was wearing a mask, not everyone was at home, but there was a huge um, shift in how we acted and how we uh, went about our lives. I think with climate change, if the threat was immediately in front of us, right, if, if it was life and death now immediately in front of us, then of course we would change our actions. But that's not the case, and that's one of the big problems. Well, let me go to Renee on that. Are we in a bit of an ironic set of circumstances here whereby that optimism bias, which was so important to our evolution and survival as a species once upon a time, may now be actually an obstacle to our survival? Right. I, I think what we just heard is an incredibly eloquent articulation of precisely why we need more nuanced messaging and narratives about what's happening, which is the fact that we cannot continue to bang on about hope or optimism or pessimism or doom, but we need to have a narrative that is more grounded and nuanced, which is to say, this is what's happening, uh, we as humans have an opportunity and a choice around how we will engage, that each one of us has a vital role to play no matter what. And you know what? We don't know how it's going to play out, but the threat is real. It's here. And um, I think we have got to thread the needle between this tendency to be so binary about optimism and pessimism. It, it kind of drives me crazy. It feels like a waste of energy. In fact, I feel like what we've just heard is, is all we need is the case for nuance. Um, and this is where media comes in. This is where leadership comes in. This is where educators come in. The other thing I'm just going to add is I don't think this is only a messaging um, situation. Okay. So I do hear that a lot as well. We need a different message on climate. We need to focus on these values or this story or these words. And, you know, yes, that's part of it. Absolutely. But I, I go back again and again to what we already know about what really cultivates humans' capacity to engage with difficult um, truths, hard truths, trauma, um, what allows us to access resilience. And it, it's, it's exactly this mix of ingredients we've just heard from everyone, which is there needs to be some urgency. There needs to be a clear sense of threat, but there also needs to be a belief that what I do is actually going to make a difference. We can't offer that to young people right now. We can't say, I guarantee that if you do this, it's going to have an impact and therefore it can short circuit that agency, that desire to wanna invest. And so what we're seeing at scale is this, this incredible epidemic of hopelessness. And I think that the way we, we break through that hopelessness is frankly by more honest and authentic and grounded messaging and approaches that are saying, you know what, we're in the situation, we didn't want this to happen, here we are and we can evolve into the next level of what it means to be a human uh, why don't you be part of this and contribute and join us? Lise, can you pick up the thread of that, the, the notion that we yes. need to change the uh, messaging? Yes. First of all, certainly agree with what's being said. One thing that strikes me is that we might be good at, and, and as Renee says, we insist too much on messaging, but we're leaving one part of the issue out, and that is often people don't know what to do. So I'm gonna say that I have seen a dramatic change in the way people are responding to a climate warnings. And I believe that people have kind of hopscotched to a place where they were kind of denial and distancing, et cetera, to a place now where there's a lot of palpable fear. So what is important now is to give a message, I think, that is targeted for people that have typically not heard it. And I don't mean the ones that have already been convinced. We don't need to address them. We need to take messages that um, are keyed into people's values 
and then saying, here's what you can do about it. We're not good at that. We're good at sounding warnings and saying, we've got to do this and imploring us to be reasonable and, and to think about these things. But what people are seeking now, we got a hotline that we're setting up that will have people recognize that they can address their emotions and then segue to here's what you can do about it. The social psychologists say it's a two-step process. Express the danger, then capture, harness the energy of the emotional response and redirect it into constructive action. And I wanna say one other thing that I think we're really leaving on the table, and that is the power of herd mentality. So for all the people, who may not be reachable personally, individually, with an intelligent message, with all of the things we're talking about, what we have to underscore is even as there are climate tipping points, there are social cultural tipping points, we are social animals. We do what other people do. When we see what they're doing, we do it. We don't even have to mention climate. If we start slathering the landscape with solar panels and all of the other aspects that are uh, signal sustainability, uh, cities that are green uh, and a transportation that is uh, um, a, a low energy, et cetera, people glom onto that. They don't ask themselves how it is that they can contribute. They follow the crowd. And that's what we're leaving on the table is the power of that herd mentality. And I think we're reaching cultural tipping points. Hmm. Let me, um, you know, at a moment like this, it feels right to hear from Captain Kirk. And I think we all remember when William Shatner went into space with uh, Jeff Bezos' operation and the profound experience uh, that he shared with people upon his return to Earth. And here's what he said. He said, it was among the strongest feelings of grief I have ever encountered the contrast between the vicious coldness of space and the warm nurturing of Earth below filled me with overwhelming sadness. Every day we are confronted with the knowledge of further destruction of Earth at our hands, the extinction of animal species, of flora and fauna, things that took five billion years to evolve, and suddenly we will never see them again because of the interference of mankind. It filled me with dread. My trip to space was supposed to be a celebration, Instead, it felt like a funeral. Mm. William Shatner, Canada's own. <laughs> you have all worked on uh, how to properly communicate climate change to people. George, I'll start with you. Is the goal, you think the goal is to get them to the same place William Shatner eventually ended up? No, I think the goal is to reinforce and validate their values and their identity. I think I'm really picking up here with what Lise was saying. Um, I think it's about making people feel Yes, people can realize there's a hard challenge, but that they can come together, they can feel proud of who they are, that they believe that they've got the skills and the agency to make a difference. You know, I've worked on some really hard crews in the course of 20 years of climate outreach. Uh, I've spent a lot of time talking, for example, with oil workers in Alberta. You know, that's a pretty tough crowd. Evangelical conservatives in the U.S., people all around the world who, for many reasons, are not drawn towards the more progressive left-wing environmentalism. And it's, an, it's a tragedy that these people are not involved. And the primary reason for that is because there's a mismatch between the way we talk about climate change and their identity. And the one thing that we find consistently when we test it is if we say to people, look, climate change, this is going to be really hard. This is difficult. This is hard. This is painful. But you, you know what? You're proud. You're strong. You've faced problems before. You can come together. Everybody has something to contribute. So I think that there's a way of having a positive message built into saying this is damn serious. But brings again, I, I think, on the point that Rene was making about about really recognizing what it is that mobilizes people, which is a which is a sense of coming together and a sense of actually really being able to do something. Having said that, Rene, do you think it would be better to have people come to the same place emotionally and intellectually as William Shatner was? Mm. I would say mm, yes, to a degree. I think that actually. Again, if we look at the psychology of change and what, what is usually a stimulus for people to make not only change, but let's be, be honest, transformation, it, it usually does require a, um, a degree of pain of, or discomfort, of, of a sense of remorse, of um, sort of accountability, responsibility. I think it's extremely important that we're not trying to evoke 
people to have a traumatic or, you know, um, distressing emotional experience. But what we're talking about, and again, building on what everyone else has said, is the ability to be with what is real, right? We're talking about facing reality here. And that is something that humans historically have had a pretty difficult time doing, <laughs> is, uh, is facing reality um, that is not only on our own terms. And so again, I, I actually think it's incredible that we have someone like William Shatner or a number of public figures starting to come out, come out more and more um, with their raw emotional human uh, experience. It really connects us with our human experience. And, and I think the, 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 the main thing I would want to drive home here is that underlying the pain and, and, and that sentiment is love. Right. It's right. love, it's care, it's concern. And that is what we want to be resourcing and tapping into um, that fuels the work that we're doing um, right now. Tally, where are you on the Shatner quote? Um, so I, I, I don't think the answer is focusing on despair and gloom and doom, which is, I think, what maybe the quote is kind of, um, but rather, um, and again, uh, I'm echoing some of the things that have been said. Rather, it's about what do we need to do to get to the goal that we want to get to? And that goal is a great goal, right? It's it's a, a goal of having our planet, um, a healthy planet. So painting a picture of this great future and the actions that we need to take very specifically to get to the future. And then doing that, as been said, using other incentives so uh, the social incentives was mentioned, but there's other incentives to get people to act for things that are good for climate change without actually touching upon climate change. There are immediate rewards that we can get by doing things that are also good for climate change. You know, the development of certain technologies can help not only climate change, but other things. So there are immediate rewards. Uh, and, and then there are also kind of other incentives, right, for in, in the UK, the price of electricity is going up, whether it's, you know, for other reasons or not. But the, the immediate uh, result of that is people are using less electricity. So using some other kind of very basic human incentives of rewards and punishment, so to speak, to get people to act in a way that that's good for our planet. Lise, you wanted to have at that? I do. And I wish he certainly has the right to feel grief. There are many people who feel grief precisely for the reason that he has described. And so we need to be respectful of outrage, despair or grief, uh, fear, et cetera. But here's what's key. And that is that you harness the energy of those emotions. What if he had said, in addition to what was written there, and here's what I'm going to do about it. I yeah. vow I'm going to spend the rest of my life helping yes. other people process their emotions about what's happening. And so that we can bring this activism and the optimism that we know is innate to us to drive the change in time. That's all he needed to do was add one line. Here's what we're going to do about it. Respecting the individual responses, the various energies embedded and redirecting it into constructive action. That's what I wish he'd done. Well, uh, OK, fair point. But George, let's look at the other side of the coin. There, there are people for whom their identity is very much wrapped up in denying the climate change catastrophe, use whatever noun you want, uh, that we're now finding ourselves embroiled in. It's part of their herd belief. How do we speak to them? Well, I'd suggest we don't speak to them. <laughs> I think the most important thing is that, is that they are hearing this from people who they know, who they trust, primarily within their own peer groups. I come back to that point again. But then beyond that, you know, within any group, there are people who are trusted. Um, I think a big problem that we've had with climate change since the very outset has been that the primary people holding the message and talking about it have been alienating to many groups of the population. I think also it's really important that we, we start to have a collective narrative of togetherness around this, that everybody has something to contribute, that we all have to work together, that we have to collectively make this change. And I'm very concerned by the way that climate change just falls into this, um, this 
this this polarizing narrative of of us versus them. So definitely, the way to a lot of my own work has been about how do we motivate people who are not involved. Very much, it's about having a different kind of conversation around different values, but primarily coming from coming from people within their own network. And if governments were serious about this. And every government in the world committed in the framework convention to informing and educating their citizens, which they have done a very poor job on, they would be actively going out there and finding ways of reaching these, these audiences in a way that's trusted. Renee, with just a couple of minutes to go here, climate shaming. A lot of people do that. Is that worth doing? Oh, boy. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, so I'm not a fan of of using shame um, or guilt. Um, I agree 100% with Lise <clears throat> that what people experience, we need to honor. Um, I'm not interested in policing people's emotional response to what's happening. I think we absolutely have to stop considering these difficult feelings as doom and gloom. That's, um, that's not at all what I would want people to leave this conversation with. I think it's really about invoking a sense of responsibility and we can invoke responsibility with our outrage and with calling out right but we don't want to be fueling our energy with uh, emotion as um as frankly uh unconstructive as shame i think we already know that the science on on the effect of shame on our neuro processes. I mean, it's just, you know, yeah, maybe it's okay for like short bursts of like, okay, I'm going to change this in response. It's not, in my view, uh, sustainable or desirable for a basis of um, kind of what, what mobilizes us. I think what we're talking about here is engaging people. It's not even to me about motivating people. I think people are frankly too very motivated. They just need to be guided and partnered with and engaged to be part of this bigger conversation. Well, I want to thank the four of you for being part of this very big conversation. That was, uh, I got to tell you, that's one of the smartest things I've seen on TV in a long time. So I want to thank all of you. Renee Lertzman <laughs> in California, Lise Van Susteren in New York, George Marshall and Tally Charrot in the United Kingdom. It was great of all of you to spend so much time with us on TVO tonight. Take good care and thank you. And thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.